You're listening to E-Commerce Fastlane, the podcast show to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Listen to real conversations with partners and subject matter experts as they share proven practical strategies, platforms, and the best Shopify apps to help you accelerate your business. The time is now for you to improve efficiencies, grow revenue, profit, and lifetime customer loyalty. Please welcome your host, startup founder and strategic advisor, Steve Hutt. Welcome back to another episode of E-Commerce Fastlane. I'm your host, Steve Hutt. You know, thanks so much for joining me today. You know, there's so many podcast choices out there and I just massively appreciate the fact that you're taking time and listening to today's episode. It's gonna be a really unique episode today because, you know, typically I'd like to go down the, the rabbit hole of apps and marketing platforms and, you know, occasionally I sprinkle in a marketing uh, agency and some of the strategy and tactics that are hot. But today we're going down a little bit of a different journey. And my guest today is Freya Seeger. And she really is a powerhouse really in the online retail space. She currently is director of site merchandising at a company called Windsor Fashions. And what's interesting about them, she has this day gig, but she's also working on her PhD right now at the Copenhagen Business School. She's got over 10 years experience. It's interesting that she really is there to help both small startups and big companies. She's worked everywhere, like Zulando, she's been there. She's helped grow a lot of businesses around the world through Europe and through North America. I know she's in, she was in Canada for quite a while. She's now, the last about four or five years ago, moved to the US, but she's got a lot of professional achievements she worked at United Nude for a while and she helped boost sales there up to 35% just in one year. I know I mentioned like Zulando and the fact that she really helped with a lot of their marketing campaigns, brought up over $8 million a month in revenue. So it's pretty impressive some of the things that she's been involved with, with her and her team. She's quite a unique, she has a lot of like real, I don't know, I'm touting a lot about her and I'm gonna let her speak in her own words in a moment, but it's interesting. She's got a lot of real world experience, a lot of academic knowledge, I think, which really helping her and her career with this PhD that I'm really excited to learn more about is the fact that she's talking about AI and how it's changing social media and online shopping. I know it's a massively hot topic right now. I mean, I'm using AI tools even for content production and there's AI tools now for social media production and some questioning about how these tools are actually picking up this content and where it's getting and the training of these models and things like that. There's lots of things to talk about today. So Faria, welcome to e-commerce Fastlane. Thank you, Steve. And thanks for that really great introduction. Happy to be here and discuss something that I'm really passionate about. Absolutely. What's interesting though, your journey, I, I kind of creeped on your LinkedIn profile and it's very fascinating kind of the, the businesses that you've been involved with. And then on top of that, the academic work that you're actually involved in now currently. And it's quite an impressive career in multiple continents, I might add. So I'm just curious, where was the spark or to get involved in e-commerce? I just find it really interesting if there are maybe a defining moment or why you got involved. I asked Debbie from Cardstars exactly the same question, trying to understand, was this like a gradual evolution in your career or was there something very particular about commerce that you wanted to be involved in? Yeah, you know, I've always known what I wanted to do from a young age. And I knew that I wanted to work in an industry that didn't limit myself in terms of where I could practice or work or live. So I kind of started on that path in studying international business and then moving into an international career. So my family is very international. I've always been that kid who had an unaccompanied minor badge around my <laughs> neck on the plane. Um, yeah, so yeah. the world was very small, you know, and, yeah. and I think in e-commerce, that world is even smaller. And I ended up in the e-com space because I started in consumer research in my career and really focused on that in my studies. And I really found that understanding humans is kind of the basis of e-commerce. So joining that community and being surrounded by people who have that same curiosity around understanding humans, how we gain trust, why we do what we do, how we make purchase decisions, that really sparked my interest to ask why and to learn more, but to also be in a space where everyone is kind of asking the same question and just being surrounded by curious people. 
Mm-hmm. What's interesting about that too, and that's again, that's a great answer. And I think it's interesting because I have the, exactly the same kind of mentality where I just, I feel that maybe as big as e-commerce is, I feel that the amount of experts in the field are few. And I think when you can finally get together a group of people and you can kind of say, no, I align myself with commerce and with e-commerce. I see where the industry is going. It just, I don't know, it, for some reason, it just makes you feel good that you're hanging it with other people that are all on that same kind of journey journey and path. And I think that's very interesting. I know you're involved and as a founding member, we should probably do a shout out right now, but a founding member of an organization uh, called Card Stars, which I know it's by invitation only. We'll talk a little later about this, but it's just, I think what's interesting and I think that's the alignment that you have from the early days. And now you kind of stumbled upon this Cart Stars community. Can you tell us a little bit about who Cart Stars is and kind of like, and how you align yourself with kind of their mission? Yeah, so I'm super happy and proud to be a part of Cart Stars. It's a great community that Debbie's built. It's essentially a community of e-commerce executives where we really build relationships with each other and we really emphasize in-person meetups, building relationships and sharing advice around vendors or best practices within mm-hmm. e-commerce and, mm-hmm. and our businesses. So it's a very relaxed environment and relaxed community with no ego to really learn from each other, to share our successes, but also admit our mistakes and learn from that. And because it's an invite only, there's a vetting process that allows us to almost trust each other instantaneously within the community. You know you're going to get great advice. You know you're going to get honest advice about vendors, for example, and it's not a pitch. Um, So I think it's a very supportive community that promotes one of each other because we have that instant trust. Yeah. I had Andreas on and he is from the Murad company. He's kind of director of logistics and warehouse operations. You likely know him and he's part of the Cartstars group. And that's one of the things that he mentioned too, was he felt that just the honest and transparency that went along with the group. And, and sometimes there's a need for something. And instead of just selecting the usual suspect platform, whatever it is that connects to whatever uh, CMS that's driving the business, he found that it's, it's just interesting to be able to ask these questions and getting some honest feedback and and without the ego and the fact that there's no vendors in this group. It really is, hey, you know, we believe that this tool was supposed to do this and, you know, and they talk about it in their marketing collateral, but when we actually implemented it, it turned out that this is wasn't right for us and here's the challenges we had and then we've now decided to go on this platform now and here's what we have found. I think that's pretty exciting that there's that kind of opportunity because I think the opposite is, is that it seems like everybody's pitching and talking about comparisons, this versus this, but they're not using real world examples of how these tools and platforms are actually helping build the tech stack for a business. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, I'm very open to vendor pitches. I actually appreciate it because that's how I learn about what's new in the industry or what new technology is out there. But Mm -hmm. of course, there's also an element of they're going to tell you what you want to hear. Um, (laughs) And I think there's there's nuances in every business that you can't cover it all. So that's where Cart Stars is a really good resource because you can say, I'm having these specific challenges, and there's an understanding from the other members in that community to say, okay, we had similar challenges, and we found that this vendor supported those, or we found that they didn't support those. Mm-hmm. So you're really saving a lot of time and a lot of money from having to spend time researching, pitching, or, or listening to those pitches, and then even trying a solution that you're not going to get the best result from. Yeah. So. I have another question for you about your PhD. Um, Hopefully I don't uncover too much of it because I know you're still in the writing and researching phase right now. But generative AI is such a incredibly hot topic. I think it was the number one kind of, other than the word hallucination, uh, it was probably like the top trending word, uh, certainly of last year, and it still continues on. It just seems like every week there's another AI tool in whatever industry you want, like Lily from fintech to martech to healthcare, you know, social media to content production. I mean, there's, you know, even in um, using these tools now in e-commerce, like for customer support and for forecasting models. And like, it seems like it's just, it's endless. And, and there's, they're a unicorn. There's billion dollar companies that are being built with like a couple founders right now. And it's just the technology is there. And so you've decided to double down and talk about its impact on social media. So um, can you talk a little bit about 
what you have found so far and where do you believe this paper is going to reveal, I don't know if you can give us like a couple tidbits of kind of what you've found so far. And is there anything to be concerned about or is there anything that maybe some brands are listening today, can they leverage some of these tools? And then let's talk about how it could be impactful for brands. Yeah, so within my career, I focused a lot on content, specifically content marketing. And that really kind of sparked my interest now with generative AI becoming such a big player within content generation. And obviously social media is driven by an exchange of content. So, you know, that's why I headed in that direction. And there's a lot of research being done at the moment on generative AI. So it's important to be quite quick. So right now, what I'm really looking at is how generative AI impacts um, what we call the tripartite system that lives within social media. So that being the user, the content creator, and then the platform itself, because inevitably generative AI will have an impact on all three. So how will the platform change their business model to potentially add additional revenue streams? How can generative AI be a value add for platforms? And then as a content creator, I mean, the role of an influencer will completely change with the evolution of generative AI. So, you know, everyone can be a great content creator in the future and you don't even need to be like social facing. Your face right. doesn't need to be right. your own brand. So you can be behind an avatar, you can be behind a digital persona that you create content for on social media. So my initial research that I've done is really looking at it from a user perspective as well and saying with the growth of AI content and with the labeling of AI content, which is mandated by legislation across most countries, how do we see engagement change? Mm. And we've done quite a bit of research to look at when we label human created content, um, AI enhanced content and generative AI content how does that engagement level and how does that kind of emotional connection with that content change? Um, And the results of that is basically that users on social media, and we used Instagram in this case, um, are more inclined to have an emotional connection with human created content. They engage more with human created content. Mm -hmm. And when asked after engaging, if they would plan to engage further, so on a behavioral level, they also intend to engage more with an account or content um, created by humans. Mm. And that becomes even stronger when we look at it from a message appeals perspective. So if you have an emotionally driven piece of content, human created content is preferred. When you have a more kind of informational or rational driven message, there's not as big of a gap between Mm. AI content being accepted versus human content being accepted. Mm. So I think there's obviously some biases to this in terms of labeling of the content. Should the labeling happen upon seeing the content? Should the labeling happen upon after seeing the content? There's little kind of nuances that need to be tested. Um, But the general sentiment is that people are really looking for that social and kind of those hedonic connections that we look for when we go on a social media platform that are really only there with human created content. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a very interesting journey to see how content creators and how platforms kind of adapt to that and how we adapt to our own behaviors to, I mean, essentially engage with AI content if necessary in the future. Interesting too, I read something and I know firsthand experience of content creators, um, the human ones, let's say for example, like on TikTok and then having an associated TikTok shop um, associated to it because really they're there to drive sales either as an affiliate partner is usually a lot of it. I mean, these are influencers and they're um, a lot of times they'll either have a custom landing pages or they're going to go to their dedicated TikTok shop or the affiliate partner's TikTok shop. What's interesting. And so there's successes on both sides of the coin um, from a retail perspective. Some people, they, they have decided that they're going to, because uh, TikTok is a little bit different just based on the demographics. And then how do you get something to be thumb stopping? It's so interesting that sometimes just the visual appeal that comes out of the initial hook, sometimes AI driven images that are, and then with the music and then having a proper script, I've seen people and they've shown it actually even go to TikTok and, and I've watched a couple of videos 
about what people are doing and some successes that are, hey, you know, it, it's, I'll need 15 AI driven images and, you know, I'll do the script first and then the voiceover and the music and all these things can all be done by AI and using CapCut or some kind of quick editing tool, like literally within an hour or less, you can produce something and sell a product quite quickly. I think it's really interesting for some creators, but on the flip side from what I've also learned is the fact that there's still significant amount of research. It's not all of a sudden you can just kind of prompt an AI. Um, you can't, you're not going to go to uh, perplexity and say, hey, well, write me a script. I want to sell this. It just doesn't work like that. And so th that there's still this human element of either if the human's not on camera, you know, they still have to write the script and have a proper hook and talk about the features, the advantage, the benefits. I'm having a proper call to action. There has to be some kind of a shock. There has to be something unique. And however they're producing it, either if they're doing it in video that's fast and snappy, um, or if they're doing it through images that they're flipping through and how the wipes and fades happen. It's so interesting that people are testing all of these things, but I think it all comes down to how it's being delivered. There still has to be human words. There has to be emotional kind of attachment to maybe even the music um, and sound effects and things. These things all need to be planned and there's just no way that AI can do these sorts of things. There needs to be human interaction. Yeah, I agree. And I think we need to look at AI as kind of a co-pilot Mm -hmm. and how we produce content. Right. So how can we really leverage AI to scale, to drive efficiencies, and to also enhance content? Because there's definitely an element of that, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But how do we kind of ingrain that authenticity, those emotions, and that creativity into something that's like generated by a computer? And, and that's kind of the big question. So I think, you know, those who have nailed it have really been able to find a balance between co-piloting with AI and human emotions and creativity. Yeah. There's been lots of tools that even just more of a side note, there's been a lot of tools. I know in the YouTuber world, you know, YouTube is, you know, owned by Google, second largest search engine in the world. A lot of people going to it. I mean, TikTok is growing as probably the third most visited platform, but yeah, Google, YouTube, TikTok. But it's just like people going to YouTube a lot. And I'm finding now these long form videos, people like attention spans, these sort of things. So they're publishing their long form videos because that's what they want to do. But they also want to be able to chop them up into smaller bite-sized snackable. And once again, co-pilot, great concept is to say that like things like Opus Clip or Submagic, there's a few other tools out there that really import this content and through AI understand through their models about where they believe the most impactful parts of this conversation was and how they're able to make a translation or a transcription and then get them auto inserted and give you all these different options and pick a few, make a couple slight edits and boom, off they go. That's a co-pilot. They can't tell you exactly what you need and know it's not perfect. And the transcription, transcription is never perfect either. But a man is just, sure is helping people deliver more content out into the wild. So it is interesting. <laughs> I'm just kind of learning more about it myself. Yeah, definitely. And I think we've all kind of tinkered with some of these tools. And it's easy to see when you start, you know, putting in the right prompts is not easy. I know. Getting the right story in there. Yeah. I've had a lot of, you know, strange visuals come out <laughs> because you're just not putting in the right prompts. So it's definitely a learning process. And I think this is the initial feedback that I've received also from my peers within e-com where, you know, we want to scale because we need more and more content and we want to create it right. quickly because things are moving at such a fast pace and people's attention spans are shortening. So right. we need more and more content and also with personalization, of course. But the resources that are out there and also the agencies that are out there that are supporting AI generated content, it's not quite there yet. And mm -hmm. I think that's because we're still trying to learn the right input to get the right output. Yeah. I know Google's been pretty harsh as of late with a lot of their updates, just this whole programmatic SEO, not necessarily writing for humans, but just trying to write for rank. And it just doesn't work. And a lot of people got slapped over the last, well, I think it happened in March it was a major core update. And then there was a, quite a few other updates, just, you know, knowing that people are producing so much content 
you know, without any authoritativeness or trustworthiness or expertise. And knowing all of that, Google is uh, really cracking down on it. And so even in my own workflow, I mean, that the human oversight is still, uh, you know, is, is paramount for what I'm even guest posts that come on my, I'm still running through Grammarly. I'm still adding a hook. I'm still adding a key takeaways and a better summary and maybe adding some authority outbound links and stuff, trying to really improve the quality of the content. And I'm teaching people and pushing it back to the guest post and say, great article, but just so you know, I spent the last 15 minutes kind of like improving it and I've now published it. Thank you. But this is what good looks like now. Maybe not great, but good uh, or good enough, but it was much better than what was produced <laughs> originally, right? So. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a great example of that kind of collaboration uh -huh. between human and AI. And yeah, definitely still need to add some tweaks to the output um, as it is today. Absolutely. So, Let's talk a bit about uh, your current employer, which is Windsor Fashions. I'd like to talk about your experience with site merchandising and like, are you in fact leveraging any AI for product discovery or personalization or search? I have a lot of skills around this area, but I'd love to, I'm not asking for your tech stack, but I'm just curious overall, if you can kind of share any success stories or challenges and things about what does it mean to be a site merchandiser and um, what are all the variables of availability and uh, sell through rate and things that go, like, I have a lot of stories that I want to share too, but I want to hear how you are uh, successful in your role as a site merchandiser. Yeah, so I think site merchandising for me is really about telling the right message at the right time. Mm. So you really want to be a great storyteller. You want to capture your audience with the right product, with the right piece of content throughout their customer journey, and essentially just creating a really you know, exciting customer journey that the customer can dive into and feel good about. Right. So at Windsor, to be honest, we aren't leveraging AI as much as we should be, but there okay. are a few things in the pipeline. So obviously using AI for personalization across site merchandising. So we have a ton of product and we do want to deliver that personalized experience. So right now that means a lot of kind of rules and algorithm based merchandising, but not providing that personalized experience to every customer that visits our site. So that's definitely in the pipeline and coming in the future. Um, we do leverage AI for customer service resolution at the moment. So we've significantly decreased our customer service touch points and time spent on that through AI. And then, of course, you know, there's the use of chat GPT to drive efficiencies in digital marketing and, and copy that we're doing, that we're using as well. I think a great example of working in fashion, but being more of a tech company first, fashion company second, was my experience at Zalando prior to moving to the US. And this was truly an innovative company. It was a, it's a platform, a multi-branded platform. Yeah. And essentially they're using AI as a co-pilot, as I mentioned, and really as a partner. So they're already creating content using, you know, mid-journey and other AI content creation tools for their campaigns. Their personalization is great. And they're, I would say they're at the forefront of that. They also started that process, you know, years ago. Outfit building, you know, leading to cross-selling, upselling, and also piloting a virtual fitting room um, mm. with personalized avatars. So there are many North Stars, but even though I don't work there anymore, I do look to them as kind of inspiration as to how AI can be used in innovative ways. Mm. It's interesting. I just, I'm on windsorstore.com right now. I added, um, for example, and maybe this is kind of a real world example of maybe you can kind of talk about what's happening here, but I'd added like the all in the, the shine necklace set. And so they put that in. Um, and then I um, looked at my cart right now and it said, you know, add these final touches. And so you have a little bit of cross selling going on before actually going to the cart and you, you are in Shopify here. So, um, yes. so what's, what's happening here about, add the final touches is this an app or is this kind of baked into the theme or is, is there something intentional going on here about hey i've added this and we believe these other items might be interesting to go along with what you've purchased yeah so we use a third-party vendor for that and okay. we're actually using monetate 
Okay. So here we're really trying to capture her, of course, at the cart and identifying, okay, what uh, products do we see being viewed together, being purchased together for any other customer that is also looking at this product in the past. We also add some, you know, easy upsell, cross-sell opportunities. So for every dress that the customer puts in the cart, adding some shapewear or a pasty in there, um, mm -hmm. which she might need for her next event. Or adding items that are under $20, for example, like an easy click add to cart. So adding in those rules within this carousel that make the most sense within this point in the journey. And now the checkout flow I find interesting too is um, what's your take on coupon sites from Honey, which is owned by PayPal, and then there's a Capital One Shopping, and there's a few others out there. Um, there's a lot of coupon sharing and discount code sharing. What's your mindset around the fact that these can be out into the wild? They could be owned by influencers that just happen to get into the public domain instead of it just being private from within a group of people as an influencer. So. I think there's two trains of thought about, you know, having rampant amount because you have quite a few coupon codes that are wild right now that people are able to apply as discount codes that maybe they quote unquote don't really deserve it. And so I just want to hear your mindset around, are you okay with that? Or um, do you believe there's technology to help maybe suppress these sorts of uh, coupons? No, not okay with that. Okay. Um, and, and maybe, <laughs> okay. maybe okay. I shouldn't admit this actually, but on that topic, um, we did recently discover that a few of our employee discount codes were running rampant out uh -huh. in the wild as well. Uh -huh. So uh, someone was getting a nice discount, but <laughs> <laughs> no, this is something that we talk about regularly, actually, because we're not a promo driven brand. Right. Um, we don't do a lot of promotions. We're at an accessible price point. And we don't want to be seen as a promo-driven brand. So um, this is quite important to us to manage that space. And I think this is where, you know, the Card Stars community comes into play because we haven't really looked into vendor opportunities um, to provide that solution. And that's something where I would go to the Card Stars community and say, you know, we're facing this issue. Um, how can we resolve that? And there will most certainly be another company and professional that will understand that within the community and provide some suggestions. So that's a great next step. And thank you for reminding me to do yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think in the past I've, I've, I've interviewed a few different uh, tech partners that do that. I think one is uh, keep cart. I think uh, keep cart is uh, there to kind of block browser extensions like honey from applying these coupon codes, or they even get a little bit trickier where the end consumer is under the impression that honey is still like cycling through these coupon codes that it has found and likely do work. But what this solution does, this app that connects to Shopify is that it doesn't allow it to work, even though it likely is valid, but the end consumer actually believes that it doesn't work. It does work, but it's blocked. <laughs> visually, even though it cycles through them all and you see the refresh in the browser. Um, no, sorry. No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not valid for the items in your cart or whatever, but there's keep cart. I'm sure the cart stars group will <laughs> share a few other uh, options for you to kind of, you know, I guess on the flip side though, some brands uh, that, you know, that I've spoken to too, there's like, Hey, you know what? Um, the coupons are very, very small. And at the end of the day, we're okay. I know it's, you're more of a value driven and not, not discount driven. So I think, you don't, you know, you just, get to the bottom and, and nobody wins. But the flip side, sometimes some small discounts, like, you know, um, first time bonus, sign up to my newsletter, get your SMS, these sort of basic ones and five, 10, 15% off. It's okay if those just continue to flow around just because if it can help improve the conversion rate a little bit because people have these extensions added to their browser and they're actively using them, or even some people even use some silly tactics, which I'm sure you're quite aware of, where people will, will add to the cart and create an account and then walk away and then hope there's going to be some kind of a, you know, a cart or browse abandonment email sequence that comes through over the next couple of days. Even my wife does that. Is it urgent to buy today? No, it's not. Okay. Um, then add to cart and don't check out and, but make sure your email address is there and sign up to everything they have and see what happens. And then a lot of times there is some kind of like, you know, I'm not saying this podcast is not here to train people how to do this. I think this is something that people just do. It's, it's, this is nothing yeah. new, right? So what's your take on this? I think we've all been known to, you know, create a second email account um, <laughs> to, to apply for those discounts. It's not a, yeah. a secret, but there are tools in place for that. And as you said, you know, 
if it's a question between making the sale and not making the sale, of course, we're happy to give right. that, let's say, 15% discount. But it's important to keep that within our marketing flow and to keep that in a sustainable and maintained environment. So I think, you know, there are certain tools like heat carts that are, are relevant for that, as you mentioned, and also just making sure that you have tools in place to not have those duplicate emails or duplicate address accounts, etc. All right. So still on the same topic around merchandising, is the Windsor Fashion Company, are you international? Are you, are you shipping to Canada and anywhere internationally currently? Yes, we are. So okay. um, we're majority based in the US mm -hmm. um, and we have 350 brick and mortar stores as well. So quite big, but we have expanded to Canada. We also just opened a couple stores um, in Canada as well. And from an e-com perspective, um, we are shipping internationally with Canada and the UK and Mexico being our, our biggest international markets. Mm. So how are you dealing with the localization? Like one thing is I think about would be uh, language. I would think about currency. I also think about the cross-border challenges that come up with duty and tax compliance, brokerage bills, and it gets even crazier when we talk about nexus and then the taxation that goes along with kind of international shipping um, and all the thresholds and stuff like that. And so it just that could be a whole podcast on its own about internationalization, but I'm just, I'm curious, I'm kind of like what your mindset is around what we're doing currently. And then is this an opportunity like for all brands to kind of be involved internationally? And is there certain things that brands need to think about? Yeah, I think it's important to be international, but to still remain local and to okay. appear local. And I think that's more important in some markets than others. So being from Canada, and I don't know if you agree, Steve, but Canada is a very national market. We like our national brands and we're very loyal to our, our national markets. We're loyal to what's in our local mall. And I think that to appear local in a country like Canada is very important. So that means partnering with someone like Global E, who we partner with at Windsor, to get that local currency and to essentially make the end customer experience as simple as possible. Because there are a lot of complexities to expanding internationally, but that should be complexity that is only seen internally. So that means local language, that means local currency, that means making it a duty-free experience for the customer so they don't have to deal with that after they've ordered their items. Right. And I think we've used Passport in the past as well um, mm -hmm. at United News, where I worked previously. And we had great success with Passport as well in terms of scaling our um, shipping costs. And the same with Global E now at Windsor. Interesting with Global E, I know Shopify has partnered with them. There's the Markets and the Markets Pro uh, edition. And I think there's some, some and I think Shopify has even made a sizable investment in Global E. At one point, they were kind of adversaries kind of doing their thing. But then I think Shopify kind of saw the light and said, hey, these guys are actually doing something quite unique. And I think there was likely some push about revenue share and kind of because there is a certain percentage points for Global E to be the merchant of record for uh, legally cross-border fulfillment. And um, so it's interesting. I'm glad that you're partnered up with them because it's cool. And I just added to cart, for example, uh, here in Canada. And I see that like in this particular product was duty, duty free on this particular case, but maybe as the price goes up, maybe because of global E it'll correctly show the potential duties and taxes that you can pay in cart. Because for those listening, I have the stats to prove it that, and you know this being Canadian, that we typically, I know we like to shop local as much as possible, but like 60, 70% of the brands that we want to shop at, unfortunately, don't really have a Canadian presence. And so we have to buy from American brands, which is okay. But it's also, I find the conversion rate to be significantly lower for Canadians buying American brands than Americans buying American brands domestically. And part of it is, is our fear about the duty and tax and the brokerage bill that's coming in from DHL. Um, and a lot of brands literally like in their shopping cart saying, hey, we're not <laughs> silly disclaimers, which is like a big blocker for conversion rates. But it's just like, hey, you're responsible for the duty and tax that may arrive when this package is not our responsibility. I'm just like, oh, I've had brands who, who've had these sorts of disclaimers in their cart. And I'm just like, okay, whoa, okay, you've got to solve this. You either have to include it in the price and you need to ship duties and taxes prepaid as just part of your label, raise your shipping price. Like, I don't care what you got to do, but don't put this crazy disclaimer, but it's even better now that Global E or Slash 
Shopify Markets Pro so that it's correctly shown in cart. And I think, and I know, I think, I know that conversion rates for Canadians buying from international brands, knowing they just feel more confident they are actually showing it versus having a disclaimer saying you're responsible for it. Oh, definitely. I can still envision my mom in the early days of e-com. If I bought something, she'd run over and be like, was it, was it an American site? You know, um, yeah. we don't want the bill later. So a hundred percent. And at Windsor, we do pay those duties for the customer. So they are included uh, in your purchase. So there's wow. no additional fees after checkout. Lovely. Yeah. I want to talk about retention strategies because I think um, it's on a lot of people's minds. I hope this show is not going too tactical for people, but I just it's interesting about how people can get the second and third sale. I'd argue that some brands, I'm not, not suggesting it's you and Windsor, but I think some brands are under like negative margin kind of on a CPA, this first initial transaction. Sometimes the cost per acquisition is more than the profit in the product. And so the next thing is, okay, well, what are we doing to wow the customer for the first delivery? And hopefully they love the product, then how do we find the next product? And I think that's where these retention strategies come in. And sometimes there's retention marketing managers like fully involved in the business. That's all they have to do is try to figure out, hey, if you bought product A, we believe using AI and some tools and little things and saying, hey, we believe that product B is likely your next purchase in this approximate time frame because we have the data to prove it. You bought this necklace, we believe you're going to buy this next because lots of people have already done that exact same thing in this time frame. And so I just want to have your feedback about how are you thinking about retention and kind of loyalty programs just to kind of make people brand ambassadors and just raving fans about the product? Um, and then how do you keep nudging them along their journey of, of wanting to purchase more product from Windsor? Yeah. So obviously having those recommendation carousels as well upon mm, checkout and use yeah. those similar kind of rules. But I just want to touch on loyalty programs because I think these are really important in driving that retention and that loyal customer who, as you said, Steve, will also be um, kind of an ambassador. So right. Um, previous to Windsor working at United Nudes, I actually implemented a loyalty program for them. And kind of when looking at how to set that up, I was like, what is important to people? And customers really want to feel important, but they also want to be part of a community. So what can you offer apart from discounts or let's say early access within a loyalty program, like access to exclusive content, you know, styling tips, blog content, access to events, access to certain thought leaders um, mm. within the community that you really want to be known in? And how can you make the shopping experience the best possible and most convenient experience? So it was interesting. Um, we worked with Friendbuy to set up the loyalty program. And I don't know at what stage they kind of said this to us, but they basically said, you know, customers have so much choice. How are you going to get them to stick with you and your brand? And it's not about having the lowest price product. It's not about having the most frequent sales or discounts. It's not about the best value for money. It's really actually, how can I inconvenience them the least? <laughs> and that seems like such a low benchmark, but it's yeah. true. Yeah. And when you think about experiences in your own life, I think of my future self and I think, okay, how can I make my life easiest in the future? Mm -hmm. And that's where these kind of convenience propositions um, really come up for customer retention and customer loyalty. So something to definitely think about. An example of a customer loyalty program that I really think works well is Sephora. I think they've really mm. nailed uh, loyalty. Yeah, nailed that on the head. Mm. They make you feel like you're part of a community at checkout. They say, thank you for being part of Sephora Rouge or whatever tier you might be a part of. They have the free trials and they have the free in-store events to attend. They have a point system. So there's just so much that they offer that there's really no other reason to shop anywhere else. And from a convenience perspective, you know, they offer their members free shipping, free returns, and their return policy is great. So I've never been inconvenienced mm. shopping at Sephora online. That's lovely. Thanks for sharing that. I think, as I said, that retention is a huge, 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 and loyalty programs and word of mouth. 
And I think that's just kind of how you're building a business. Having a great products, having great products is definitely the first starting point. Um, and, you know, the seasonality that goes with it and bringing out new lines. And that's just typical kind of one-on-one in, in the fashion world. But it's just building these brand ambassadors and having a program in there. I mean, we didn't get into the, into like, you know, the influencer side of the business and driving that, that sort of revenue too. But another podcast for that. Before we kind of go today, another topic that's on my mind is around the sustainability. Because I think, you know, the, the fashion industry in general, some have this stigma about the fact that, you know, people aren't wearing their clothing as much. I don't know what the stats are. Like they're going to wear it like three to five times or six to eight times before they kind of give it to goodwill or dispose of it. You know, I see these visuals of like these, these countries where there's, you know, container loads, boat loads full of clothing. They turn into these mountains of clothing that are just been discarded. And I just want to have your mindset around about sustainability in general. And I think it's all parts. It could be the supply chain. It could be the fulfillment process. I think there's, there's lots of parts to this kind of sustainability and kind of ethical use of the human capital of manufacturing and just want to get your mindset around it and kind of what Windsor is implementing and doing because of these sorts of mindsets. Yeah. So I want to preface that with saying that I'm really happy that the industry is moving in this direction. It's very needed. You know, we've all seen the images um, of clothing being discarded and, and we do need to be more considerate of our environmental footprint. um, All of us. So I think There's a lot of greenwashing going on that's still a big problem in the industry. You know, these mainstream terms like vegan products or brands starting additional lines or sub-brands as sustainable collections. So when we look at vegan, you know, we're really just putting more plastic into the world. And when we have sub-brands, we're creating more product and producing more products. We're not solving the problem. So it's really around looking at traceability, um, durability, being able to repair your clothes and offering that as an option and recycling your clothes. And I think customers are, are really savvy. They understand that you can't just offer them, you know, a collection of vegan styles and call yourself sustainable. It's about the entire supply chain mm-hmm. and it's about the transparency. And I think just looking at previous companies that I've worked for, it's about educating the customer because sustainability can be very confusing, very convoluted. So, how do you explain what sustainability means on a general scale, but also what sustainability means to you as a company? So there's all of these certifications, there's, you know, different materials being used, and those are kind of on a a global scale. But what does that mean to that business and that brand? So I think just kind of going back to Zalando and, and the sustainability strategy there that I was quite involved in from a content perspective. It was really about driving transparency and learning together as a brand with the customer. And that was really the story that we told. It was, hey, we're learning and we're learning with you. And everything that we learn about this, we're going to share with you across all elements of the supply chain. So whether that be the story of where the materials are coming from, a story of the factory and the factory workers, the certifications and what they mean and what they stand for and which ones we're applying or what happens to your clothing after you buy it. Mm -hmm. So do we offer a list of global or national repair places that we've partnered with to take in your clothing for repair? Do we offer a circularity program where you can send your clothes back to us and we'll resell it? Or can you donate your clothes for recycling? So it kind of is like a full start Mm -hmm. to end process and to call yourself sustainable with today's kind of customer knowledge, you really need to have the full picture. And I think it's also important to have that messaging come from the top for customers too. So how is your, for example, CEO involved in driving these initiatives and how does it trickle from the top through your entire organization? Yeah. One thing I I also want to note is that I don't know, you know, if you're aware, but the EU has just passed a fast fashion ban in Europe, Mm. which will slowly come into effect. So this will inevitably change also how we buy and advertise fast fashion in North America over time. And it's things like not being able to advertise fast fashion to consumers, um, having a fast fashion tariff, 
and a need to provide that transparency to customers on the entire supply chain. So just something to take note of and, and to follow that will be interesting for us at Windsor um, to see how that changes, especially for our bigger competitors like Shein and Timu, who mm. are definitely impacted by this fast fashion regulation. It's interesting too about this whole industry and the resale side of it. I think it's a really smart business strategy to go down this rabbit hole because I used to manage uh, Tentry and they're at Tentry.com and Tentry.ca. And what's interesting, you know, hey, you buy something from them and they plant ten trees and they have a whole story behind it. But what I found interesting when I was with them and building with them at Shopify, they decided to use a, a platform called Treat. So it's T-R-E-E-T dot co. And essentially it's a branded solution and a lot of big ones, uh, Ministry of Supply and uh, Cuts Clothing and um, obviously Tentry and, and many others are using this platform. And really it, it helps put your products in the resale market. And so Tentry has been really um, forward thinking about, hey, we're clearly environmentally friendly brand from all parts of supply chain um, and we're planting trees. And when you're done with the product and you want to sell it in the aftermarket to get something new, um, yeah, Girlfriend Collective, like Riley and Crew, like there's a lot of really big brands. I'm just looking at some of the logos on here. Very interesting opportunity out there for brands that are listening saying, hey, um, if this is something that you want to do with your business, there are platforms that can really help you create a very sustainable and long-term kind of like brand strategy around used clothing. And these people want to do that because that's why they're shopping at Tentry or why they're shopping at wherever they're shopping because they know they have this opportunity and it's fully baked into their solution. Yeah, thank you for bringing awareness to that. And I think there's also good rental companies out there Absolutely. to kind of reduce your consumption. Yeah, lots of great options. Yeah, this is awesome. Well, I, you know, this has been a really, uh, I always joke on the show, but I've written like a ton of notes. That's always can tell us a good, a good show when there's lots of notes here. I think it, it was a little bit tactical more than I wanted today, but I think it's, it's important, you know, for people that are listening that, hey, there's opportunity out there and it's just, it's how you're positioning your business to the market and your uniqueness. And there's a lot of like individual things that can make a brand successful. Is there any kind of like, key takeaways and, and or any kind of like next steps for those that are listening and they like your journey and they like what you're talking about with generative AI and they like the merchandising ideas you have and they just, they like your journey. What do you believe some of the next steps are and any kind of key takeaways that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I think for me, it's just continuing to ask, you know, why and driving that curiosity of mm -hmm consumers and, and why we do what we do and to really deliver on that great customer experience through e-com and through site merchandising. And for me, you know, I've been lucky enough to bridge my academic and professional interests together as they very much cross paths um, from a content perspective, you know, marketing and social media and now moving into that AI realm. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to support both worlds and, and that they support each other. It gets very busy. Um, <laughs> and after 10 years of being out of school, you know, I, I kind of feel like a terrible student, but you know, <laughs> it's always interesting to learn. And I would also welcome anyone to reach out to me um, on LinkedIn or send me an email. I'm always happy to meet up or have a virtual coffee to learn from each other and also to mentor anyone who's starting out in their e com career. So I've been lucky enough to have many great mentors along the way. I've worked internationally, so I do, you know, have lots of opportunities within my network globally, and I'm happy to share that. That's lovely. I'll have all of this in the show notes for this episode, and it's Freya, so it's spelled F-R-E-Y-A, and it's Seeger, S-E-E-G-E-R. Uh, you can look her up on LinkedIn and um, kind of follow her there and connect. And yeah, but this has been lovely. Thank you so much for, you know, just being honest and transparent and Friday afternoon kind of recording today. I think it's lovely that we just, it's nice to hear, you know, what senior leaders and people that are really passionate about commerce, kind of what they're doing versus maybe, hey, I have this app and it does X, Y, and Z. I think it's nice to hear that, you know, there's more higher level kind of a C-suite kind of opportunity here and kind of how you're, you know, seeing the business and the businesses that you worked with. And hopefully the show has been impactful for those that are listening today, that there's lots and lots of opportunity and there's lots of great people People out there um, that can be mentors and people you can be aligned with and uh, you're certainly one of them so once again thanks for coming on the show thank you steve for having me all right take care 
Well, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank you personally for being a loyal listener of e-commerce Fastlane. It's my hope that this podcast is offering you a ton of value through growth strategies, tactics, and exclusive insider tips on the best Shopify apps and marketing platforms, all with my personal goal to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Thanks for investing some time today and listening to the show. I'm so proud and excited that you have a growth mindset and are a constant learner. I truly appreciate you and your entrepreneurial journey. Enjoy the rest of the week and keep thriving with Shopify.